Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to have the honour to introduce this year's uh, Moynihan lecturer, uh, Professor Jonathan Beard. Uh, Professor Beard is a graduate of uh, Guy's Medical School in 1979, an interesting year because it produced two other vascular surgeons who are eminent members of this society. Uh, they're also, of course, useful sources of information about Professor Beard's undergraduate existence. Uh, suffice to say, it seems to me that he enjoyed his time at medical school, and we'll perhaps leave it at that. He uh, progressed from uh, there uh, to undertake a piece of research in vascular surgery in Bristol with uh, Mike Horrocks and Roger Baird, uh, and eventually uh, took up a consultant post as a vascular surgeon uh, in Sheffield, where he joined uh, Professor Richard Wood and helped to create the Sheffield Vascular Institute, uh, one of the larger vascular institutes in, in the UK, uh, and certainly one of the largest ones outside London at the time that it was created. Uh, Jonathan has published widely on two main areas, vascular surgery and on surgical education and training. As a result of that, he is the president of the Vascular Society and currently the Royal College of Surgeons of England's director of education. Uh, Moynihan, as you all know, uh, felt passionately about surgical training, so today's lecture is very apposite, uh, and we're delighted to welcome, as his friends told me, the tallest vascular surgeon in the United Kingdom to deliver this year's Moynihan Lecture. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I'm, uh, to, I'm very honoured to be invited to give this lecture. I'm actually the tallest vascular surgeon in the world, so uh, uh, that's because Bob Rutherford, who also had a similarly uh, enjoyable time in medical school, uh, uh, is, has shrunk a bit, uh, uh, sadly died now. But uh, So uh, if you know of anyone who's taller, then let me know. I'll hand over my uh, crown with, with uh, delight. Um, I'm actually going to be on this stage again in a month's time, uh, the, international, uh, the National uh, Barb Barbershop Convention. There'll be over 1,000 barbershop singers in this room. And uh, we, won the gold, we won the silver medal last year. We're looking for the gold medal this year. So if you want to come along and listen to some barbershop, come along in a month's time. Normally, I sing baritone, but uh, after a, a week of Icoset and ASGBI, I seem to have sunk down to a bass. So, so um, what would Lord Moynihan have made of this? This is uh, a modern production line for... Uh, for uh, uh, cars. And of course, um, so if we're looking at a surgical training program, it is rather like a production line. Um, so I'm going to use the production line analogy a little, a little bit. So there's some important questions if you're in charge of designing that production line, which I, uh, in my previous incarnation as, as director of higher surgical training and previously core surgical training in, in South Yorkshire was responsible for. What is the end product? And, looking into, and that's difficult when you have to look into the future. And car manufacturers have the same problem. You know, they, they produce concept vehicles every year, most of which never get, off the, never get anywhere near a production line. Are we looking at a, a general purpose runaround that can do everything, rather like uh, uh, David Greenaway would like? Or are we looking at uh, uh, the souped-up uh, sports car super specialist colorectal surgeon that uh, many of the audience aspire to be? Um, and what is the specification? Um, uh, are we, uh, what are the required attributes of this, of, this, uh, of this vehicle? And then what's the quality going to be like? You know, can we afford, even in this country, the, uh, the, the Rolls-Royce? Um, certainly, 90, uh, this talk is not applicable to 90% of the world. Uh, it's certainly not applicable to Africa, India, uh, South America, um, and probably China. And what's the production capacity? Many of the, the older members in this room will remember this car was the DeLorean, which uh, was a complete fiasco. Um, although it did produce a very useful car for Back to the Future movie, but th that's only one car. <laughs> so not a very large production capacity. So the end product. This is a current model we have in most hospitals in the UK and many other countries where we have um, uh, doctors who are trained to be a specialist on a technique, really. You're a surgeon, you're a physician, you're a radiologist, whatever. Uh, 
But actually, um, I think what we need to move towards, and we, we, what we've done in vascular surgery, is actually move towards a disease-specific generalist, which actually fits quite well with Greenaway. And the reason for that is that techniques change, but diseases rarely do. Um, and a disease-based approach is more holistic. The problem for surgeons or interventionists is that a disease-based approach where actually you're spending most of your time not, not doing operations is actually a problem in terms of a volume-outcome relationship. So how do you get around that problem for the individual? Well, one way around the problem is to have a multidisciplinary team approach where uh, you train in the uh, core of your disease in a common stem. Uh, neuroscience is a good example of this. And then you uh, might uh, diversify a bit towards leaning towards intervention. You know, so I said intervention, not surgery. Medicine and diagnostics. And diagnostics is going to be a very big growth industry in the next few years. So all doctors work in a multidisciplinary team. The problem is that this model only works in very large centers. And for vascular surgery, for instance, we'd be looking at 30, probably only 30 centers in the UK. Um, so what's the specification? What do we want the future surgeon or future interventionist to look like? I say I make no apologies for this movie because I don't know how many of you have seen it before, but it's a bit of light relief. So. And at Guy's Hospital, I actually was a student when there was a surgeon like morning, this gentlemen. at Guy's Good Hospital. Good morning, sir. Not late, I hope. Not at all, sir. Come along, my man. You must pursue me. You must pursue me. I suppose you've got another half dozen boring cholecystectomies today. Can we just have yes, the lights sir. down a bit as well? Last night, I feel like one myself. How about that gastrectomy I did yesterday? Not so well, sir. Oh, fit in. Great fit in. Morning, sister. Good morning, Sir Lancelot. Everything ready? All ready, sir. Splendid. Now, you just lie still, old fellow. I've just got to discuss your case with these uh, young doctors here. Take his pajamas off, sister. You, examine his abdomen. <coughs> ah, take that grubby fist away. The first rule of diagnosis, gentlemen. Eyes first and most. Hands next and least and tongue not at all. Look! Have you looked? Yes, sir. See anything? No, sir. Very good. Carry on. Gently, man! Gently! You're not making bread! Don't forget to be a successful surgeon. You need the eye of a hawk, the heart of a lion, and the hands of a lady. You found it? Yes, sir. Well, what is it? A lump. Well, what do you make of it? Is it kidney? Is it spleen? Is it liver? Is it dangerous? No, don't worry, my good man. You won't understand our medical talk. Uh, you, what are we going to do about it? Um, cut it out, man! Cut it out! Where shall we make the incision? Nothing like large enough. Keyhole surgery, damnable. Couldn't see anything. Like this. I don't worry, this is nothing whatever to do with you. Now, you. When we've cut through the skin, what's the first substance we shall find? Uh, subcutaneous fat, sir. Quite right. And then we come across the surgeon's worst enemy, which is what? Speak up, man! Blood, you numb skull! You cut a patient, he bleeds until the processes of nature form a clot and stop it. This interval is known scientifically as the bleeding time. You, what's the bleeding time? Uh, ten past ten, sir. <laughs> okay. Uh, mo it cracks me up every time I read that. So, we clearly probably don't want a surgeon like that in the future, although one of the things he said was very interesting was the, uh, was the eye of the hawk, the heart of a lion, and the hands of a lady, <laughs> which actually has, some, uh, has some, uh, a bit of truth. So, w before we design a production line or, uh, for training, we need to know what the attributes are we want to look at and uh, uh, what we need. And, and these are some attributes you might want to consider for a surgeon of the future. The question is, and then, and then the question is, what priority you put them in? And that cr creates an intense debate, of course. So the, the answer, of course, is you want all of them, but which ones are you going to look for first? And uh, I would suggest that maybe um, the, the ones about resilience and adaptability and communication, teamwork, and leadership are the ones we really need to be focusing on because we don't actually know what a surgeon is going to be doing in te 10 years, let alone 30 years' time. So flexibility is going to be absolutely crucial. So this comes down to the issue of selection, because it's a crucial decision, but one that has minimal investment and very little research. 
If you look at other industries, they spend a lot of money on selection because they know that if they get the right people in at the, at the front end, that you don't have any problems later. And this huge investment in surgery is, a, is, a really, is, is wasted unless you get the right people in. So we need to test all the attributes, and that's blueprinting. All, everybody, many of the audience here are examiners, uh, or will be examiners, and know very well about blueprinting. And what, so if we blueprint for an exam, why on earth aren't we blueprinting for selection? Um, the selection centre approach we've now introduced is an improvement, but it's certainly still less reliable than the exams. Because why? Because we don't spend as long doing it. And then we move to appointment for consultant posts, which is still, in most parts of the country, based on an interview, which we know is wholly unreliable. And therefore, we have a huge potential, at both at the front end and the back end, of making mistakes, which is costly, and also having bias, which, of course, is unfair. And this is a good example. If you look at women surgeons in the UK, you can see that uh, the numbers in red of trainees is increasing and is getting towards the 50% uh, well, mark. And yet, look at the numbers who are appointed as consultants. There's a big gap there. So they're getting into training now, but they're not getting the consultant jobs. Why? Because the consultant appointment process is wholly unfair, unjust, and open to bias. So uh, if we look at um, a training system, that's wherever you are in the world, that's your assessment framework. You're selected, you have in-training assessment, and then certification stroke consultant appointment. And if we look at, at, at how that's evolved, in the past, the emphasis was very much on the certification and the consultant appointment. People waited years hanging around to get their consultant job. The present situation has evened out a bit more. I would suggest that in the future, we need to put a lot more effort into selection, and then everything else can be a relatively light touch, which occurs in other industries. You can't be failing people at the end of training. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. So now we move on to the quality of training, and we know it's, it's a fact, um, I'm sure everyone in this room would agree, the acquisition of procedural skills uh, requires many hours of practice, not work, practice. And we know that procedural skills, procedural experience at work of trainees is falling for many reasons which have been rehearsed over, uh, over the last few days at this meeting. And, uh, 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 but the bottom line is that it is no longer acceptable to practice on patients and, like it or not, there will be restrictions on hours of work, which is largely to do with hours of rest, because that's important for the worker and the public safety. And those things aren't going to go away. So what do we do? Well, we could extend the duration of surgical training. We've already heard from Richard Resnick that our training system is already unacceptably long, and the messing around the edges that Greenaway suggested aren't really going to do the trick either. We need a radical overhaul, I would suggest. My personal view is we should scrap foundation. Um, uh, and uh, but that's my view. Um, or we could just scrap and ignore the working time regulations. We know that most European countries, and everybody always blames the French, of course, but uh, you know, you know, most, most, many European countries just totally ignore the working time regulations. However, there are countries like Denmark where they train very good surgeons in 36 hours a week. The key is to make training more efficient, isn't it? That's the way to do it. So. Um, don't rail against the things you can't change, change the things you can. Um, and we should clearly prioritise service over training, uh, training over service. We need to improve the clinical and educational supervision. Uh, we need a culture of assessment and feedback. Technology enhanced learning is going to be very important in the future. And we need to integrate courses and simulation to the curriculum. Again, all these things have been discussed in the last few days. So prioritising training. Um, uh, this is particularly relevant in the UK, but it's, it's relevant to other countries as well. <clears throat> At the moment in this country, training is a byproduct of NHS service commitments. Um, uh, uh, and there are no NHS targets for training. So if you were the chief executive of an organisation where you know, the, tr the quality of the training in your institution was of no relevance to your career progression or the, uh, or the amount your hospital gets paid, why on earth would you spend any time bothering with it? And that's exactly the view of most chief executives. Um, they, they, they are, they are, on short, they are short termists. They are there. They, they only have a short lifespan. They're not interested in the future of the NHS. Why would they be? 
So the Temple Report in 2010, commissioned by Medical Education England, recommended prioritising training over service. What happened, uh, it was a challenging report, I thought very robust, very well laid out, very clear recommendations. It was buried uh, because it was, it was just unacceptable because the implication was that um, trainees uh, would be being trained, not providing service, and the service would collapse. A recent review by, commissioned by the Department of Health and chaired by Norman Williams has come to sort of, sort of similar conclusions, but a little less uh, bold. And I, I think the reason for that is that I think Norman is hoping that if they're not quite so challenging, they might get sneaked through a bit more easily, but we'll see. Um, there is a point here, though, that service commitment has value in terms of responsibility and professionalism. So you don't want to divorce the two. But I would suggest that why should, why should a trainee suddenly be able to do things independently uh, uh, or, or at a certain point in, in, after eight years? Surely if we have a competence-based competency -based curriculum and, and uh, uh, then a trainee who is competent to undertake something or, uh, should be able to be allowed to do it, to participate in the service. And therefore you could have uh, trainees participating in service uh, much earlier on. But in, a, but in a more valid way. So, in, in Sheffield, we did a big study a few years ago looking at workplace based assessment. One of the byproducts of that, we had to identify trainees and operations and patients who were suitable for training. Over 50% of the cases that we identified as suitable for training were not utilised. And the main reasons for that was that there was a lack of a trainee. The, the trainee who was suitable for that training opportunity wasn't there because of other commitments. There were rotor commitments, usually. Those rotor commitments were often determined by, a, by a, an administrator rather than a doctor. And the consultant was not prepared, or a consultant was not prepared to supervise. And that was largely because of service pressure. There wasn't time on the list to spend a bit of extra time in training. So, Without any changes in working time directives or anything else, if hospitals um, prioritise training opportunities, uh, uh, identify them ahead of time and planned, then we could, we could greatly increase um, training opportunities within those existing working hours. Uh, and, and we've got evidence that that can be done because um, David Jones in uh, the University of South Manchester um, got funded by the Health Education England for a better training, better care pilot. And the key here that that pilot was supported by the chief executive of the trust. And, and administrative support was provided for the trainees so to, to coordinate this. And Richard Resnick's competency-based program in, 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 in Ontario says the same thing. If you want to organize training properly, you have to have an administrator in charge of training. They, they timetabled that they had protected training lists, only one in eight. And they timetabled, but they timetabled the trainees for those lists three months ahead in advance and, and in, included, included regular workplace-based assessment. And the training, uh, the, the, the second column across there, the furthest right column, shows the results after the pilot was introduced and, and the numbers in MOVE are the training operations. And you can see the training operations increased. In, interestingly, the non-training operations didn't decrease, so the service, uh, there was no loss to service. And that raises the question of how to do, implement this nationally. And the most obvious way to implement this nationally would be to have a training tariff. If your hospital, if, you, uh, if, the, or if the operation is, is supervised by a supervisor, then the hospital gets a an extra tariff for that supervised operation. It's a simple way of doing it. The number, we don't have to introduce any new technology to do this. So at the moment, so we now have an um, educational system with Health Education England who have the education budget, i.e. the teeth. That was the problem with medical education England. They didn't have the budget. And local education providers, and that means trusts for hospital consultants, for hospital trainees, will have to demonstrate that adequate training is supported, is being provided. Trusts will no longer be able to use the postgraduate money or, in fact, the undergraduate money to prop up their service. The problem for that, if that is, and this is what Aradazi proposed many years ago, which is the same model as research, um, it was taken out from all hospitals and then put back in to hospitals that could do research. It's exactly the same model. The problem is many hospitals actually will go bust if we take out their, their education money. So the money, and the other thing is the money needs to flow down to the directorate level because that's where the job planning is done. And if the, direct, the clinical directors of the service don't have that money to allocate to training, it won't change. 
How do we include clinical and educational supervision? Well, at the moment, all consultants in, uh, are, are regarded as trainers. Many have had no training, and some, actually quite a large number, have absolutely no inclination to do it either. If they don't have the inclination or time uh, or training, then don't use them as trainers. The problem is, at the moment, we're desperate for trainers, which is why we accept almost anyone who can walk and talk to be a trainer. Trainers in primary care, on the other hand, in the UK, are regulated. They are properly trained. They have to be approved by the GMC. It takes five years of training. And they're paid to teach and have the time to do so. And the GMC has introduced similar process of recognition for all trainers. So I think within five years, we will see that that is a similar requirement for all trainers. Technology-enhanced learning. This is the new, the new buzzword. Uh, it's, this is the Department of Health framework, which was shown a couple of days ago. Uh, in this uh, room. And these are all the technologies that are coming in. E-learning, most people know about M-learning, that's the same as e-learning but on your phone or tablet, which is what we've been doing uh, over the course of this symposium. Um, simulation, home simulations, uh, those of you who are at the Innovation and uh, Innovations Prize presentation uh, uh, on, the set of, on the first day of ICASET. Um, will will have seen some of these new home simulations which are getting very sophisticated uh, and, and it's based on games technology, of course. Blended learning and serious gaming. So serious gaming is an interesting area uh, because there's a lot of psychology about gaming. So you don't, what you don't, if you want to get somebody to learn a skill, you can introduce a serious game. This is one example. We probably won't go all the way through it. This particular um, level. Uh, can you put the lights down again, please? To, uh, so uh, I'm make, I make no apologies the for, the, for the quality of this. It's off the with, screen. With the blue spheres that they found, those are the energy spheres. They take elevators up to try to get to their goal. You see the, you see the left hand and the right hand. These are the, uh, the hands that you actually control. The left hand has now selected the tweezer, as has the right. As you can see, the robots have... have Idle animations are looking around, collecting those orbs. And the player actually has to uh, start to uh, inventorize scrap metal to be able to do the building process. So here, he's taking his scrap, throwing it down in the melter, and you immediately see a couple of options. Here, the left hand is a tweezer and the right hand is a driller. He's drilling and releasing the scrap, throwing it back into the melter. This is the, the process of um, gathering some of the scrap metal. So he has two options, either build, build an L. Okay, so um, the point about that model is that that game is that it's not trying to be a laparoscopic game. It actually is teaching really important laparoscopic skills because it's, if you noticed, it was blurry around the edges, just like a laparoscopic picture, and it used the same two um, instruments with the same pivot problems. So you've got a game which is nothing about doing an operation, but actually it teaches people th about the fields of field, you, field effect of, a, of, a, of laparoscopic surgery and using the, the tools. And you can get people up to a very high level of laparoscopic skill on a game that they enjoy playing, and that's the secret. So you look at the metrics you want to pe people to learn and you import them into a game. But what you don't do is try and make a game which, which is the same as the operation. Well, that means we could actually have medical students, people at school, uh, even before they go into surgery, having the skills needed to do surgery, um, which is an interesting concept. And of course, if we publicize those skill, the skills we want to select on, you'll find that everybody coming in for surgical training already has those skills. And you can ask them what their game score is, which would be an interesting way of selection. Um, another issue is skills courses, and as, as the um, director, uh, the professor of surgical education at the College of Surgeons, of course, I have a responsibility for running all the courses the college delivers. We run, we deliver over uh, uh, over 400 courses a year to over to nearly 10,000 uh, uh, trainees and consultants. So it's a big program. The problem we have is that trainees often attend a course but then have no opportunity to practice. And the analogy here is the, the, the girl here with the shiny new bicycle. So the trainees uh, come on the course, uh, we give them the shiny new bicycle, three-day course, we get them off uh, learning to ride it, probably a bit wobbly, 
even after three days. And then we say, off you go and practice. But as, as they go away, we take the bike away. How am I going to carry on practicing to learn to ride a bike if you don't give me the bicycle to practice on? The school centre is only open uh, nine till four. Uh, I'm on a rotor, which means I can't get to the school centre, or there isn't one in the hospital. Um, the school centre didn't know I was going on a course. The school centre hasn't got the bicycle that I was taught on. <laughs> There's just no joined up thinking going on in the UK at the moment, and most other places. Hospitals invest in a brand new shiny school centre. There aren't any staff in it. You know, this is, <laughs> it's just, uh, it's just a, a mess. Um, and the other problem is that many courses are actually, all trainees know that the, the courses are essential for their progression, but the only one that's, uh, but they're not uh, mandatory. The only one that's mandatory in the UK is ATLS. Why aren't they mandatory? Because if they're mandatory, then somebody has to pay for them, not the trainee. And the deaneries, at the moment, refuse to say that they will pay for them, and therefore the GMC will not make them mandatory. You know, this is, this is car before horse stuff here. If they're essential, then they should be identified as such. We mustn't forget that, procedure, that uh, procedural skills is not just technical skills. Of course, it's non-technical skills, and uh, that, those, those are some of the non-technical skills I've listed there. Uh, for those of you who are at ICASET, there was a really good workshop on Wednesday morning about non-technical skills. Or, um, and, and, the, and Atul Gawande uh, uh, has done all, a lot of work, of course, showing that the majority of uh, complications not just in surgery, but in other high-risk industries, such as oil industry, uh, uh, arise from failings in non-technical, not technical skills. So that's where we need to put money in the future. So this is the non-technical skills for surgeons, or NOTS, which is designed, which provides a framework and terminology for assessing non-technical skills. Uh, we now have a pilot on the ISCP for this, and I'd encourage all trainers, trainees and all trainers to please engage in that pilot because it is a pilot, we want to know how, whether, it's, whether this is a feasible assessment methodology. But it needs to be involved. We also need to move forward with team training as well, obviously. So who needs training uh, in, uh, in, the, in, in, in surgery? Well, the answer is, of course, everyone needs training in surgery. Everyone in this room needs training, not just the trainees, all the consultants, because... Uh, you can guarantee that what you learnt when you finished your training is not what you're going to be doing in 10 or 15, 20, 30 years' time. When do surgeons need training? All the time. Not just a one-off event. As again, this is lifelong learning. What's the aim of training? Well, for trainees, obviously, uh, we obviously of, automatically think that the aim of training is to acquire new skills, not just technical skills professional skills, non-technical skills, whatever. And, but consultants equally are going to need, and SAS doctors are going to need acquisition of new skills as well. These are some crucial areas which many, doctor, many surgeons will have to get to grips with. Informatics. We are faced with a huge information overload. We have to be skilled at informatics to be able to, to, to glean the evidence base that we require for our practice. Robotics. Da Vinci robots have been around it for a while, but there are, there are new robots coming out almost every week. Uh, and, uh, and, and, deal, and understanding robotics is going to be really important for surgeons of the future. 3D printing is now a reality. There are skill centers around the world who are using 3D printing for generating the models for their, for their skills labs. And 3D printing is being used to, for cranial replacement, for maxillary facial replacement, orthopedics. So in the future, trainees in some specialties will have to be au fait with 3D printers because you'll have one in the corner of your operating theater to, to, to create the, 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 the implant to put into your patient. And how is this improvement in skills come about? So it's an acquisition of skills is important, but I would say improvement of skills is equally important. I, don't th I think we should remove the word maintenance, maintenance of skills. It's a terrible world. Nobody should be maintaining their skills. Everyone should be focusing on improving their skills as much as possible. Continuous quality improvement is the mantra. And how do we, how do we continuously improve our skills? By a commitment to continuous uh, to improvement through a process of self-reflection, and seeking feedback from others, and probably mentorship as well. Now, if the senior surgeons in this room 
uh, don't engage in that process and don't visibly demonstrate that they are engaging that process, how on earth do you expect your trainees to, to do it, to do it also? Because, you know, you are, the, the role modeling is still a powerful educational tool. And unless we role model this, uh, this stuff, trainees will just ignore it. So, what is the future of surgical training? Uh, more investment and research into selection and in training methodology. Protected time for training and better pay and recognition for trainers. Technical skills honed to perfection on games and simulation even before people go into surgical training. Much more emphasis on non-technical skills training for individuals and teams. I think team training should be mandatory for all teams, all surgical teams in the NHS. And lifelong learning through a culture of constructive assessment and feedback, and, uh, and the trainers have to, have to lead on that example for the future. So that's the end of my talk. I, I thank you for your attention, I, and once again, I, I thank uh, the Royal College of Surgeons of England for the honour of presenting this Moynihan Lecture.